Discord. Okay, there it is. Thanks, okay. Chris. Sorry about that. Then, Take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, yeah, I, I'm excited to see what images the, uh, the new James Webb Space Telescope produces for us to inspire the next generation of um, the next generation of astronomers and astrophysicists and, and even anybody who's interested in anything that has to do with planets, including our own. Uh, so I'm actually going to stop my video because sometimes I um, my internet kind of drops out. So that should help. Let me let me get my sharing back up here real quick. Okay. All right, it's already starting to be slow. Okay, does does that look right? Is are we back? Are we good? Yep, yeah, that's great. All right, thank you. I'm, I'm very excited to be here and give this talk at the Scripps IGPP. So I am gonna be talking about how we can use the smallest stars to understand habitability throughout our galaxy. And if you saw uh, the physics colloquium last year, you, you might've seen something very similar to this. So I, I apologize for that. It's been a, an interesting year as all of you know. So um, here on this plot, I'm showing you uh, all the known terrestrial planets. So the x-axis is the orbital period of the planet. And that's basically a proxy for the orbital distance from its host star. And on the y-axis, I'm showing the temperature of the host star. So I've also plotted here the terrestrial planets in our own solar system um, <clears throat> for reference. So here I'm gonna, uh, my, okay. So here I'm, I'm adding the sun on the y-axis, so you know exactly where that is. Uh, and temperature is also a proxy for mass. So basically, as you decrease in temperature, you're decreasing in mass. So, um, so you can think of this as kind of a mass gradient as you're going down. So we like to call stars that fall within this temperature range solar type stars or sun-like stars. And since mass is decreasing as you go down, we call these less massive stars, low mass stars. So next I'm gonna show you where the known habitable zone planets are. And you know, you kind of have to take this with a grain of salt because the way we define habitable zone is that it has to be within a certain size or mass uh, of, of earth. And it also has to be able to sustain um, liquid water. So it has to have an equilibrium temperature that would allow for liquid water on the surface. And the, the one striking feature you'll see here is that almost all of the known habitable zone planets are found around low mass stars. And these planets in particular are gonna be invaluable targets for future facilities aiming to find biomarkers bio, uh, bio and techno signatures. And that's basically what something like the James Webb Space Telescope uh, was designed to do. So hopefully in the next decade, we'll, we'll see if we can find anything. Um, and uh, another interesting thing uh, that you might notice here is that there are, aren't any real uh, Earth-like planets around sun-like stars uh, yet found. Um, and that's because it, the sensitivity that we thought we were gonna have from, from our early, uh, our our early space telescopes isn't quite uh, what we hoped it would be. So we're still kind of looking for that Earth analog around a sun-like star. Um, we have some things that are close, but nothing that is, uh, you know, very similar to Earth or to our solar system yet. <clears throat> so those are the, the habitable planets around the, the low mass stars. And then we should talk a little bit about terminology uh, about low mass stars. So I kind of hinted in the previous slide um, why we should care about them. So the, the most important thing to understand here is that to know your planet, you really have to know your star very well. It's all tied to stellar characterization. So these low mass stars, they're also known as M dwarfs. And that's basically uh, based on their position on the spectral sequence. And it's tied to their temperature, um, which is also kind of tied to their, their mass and radius here and their luminosity, which is how bright they're shining. 
So here I'm showing you a comparison um, of our sun on the left and then a low mass star uh, right next to the sun in the middle. And then those objects on the right are a brown dwarf and a, a Jupiter analog. So you can see that um, a low mass star in terms of size is, is much similar to something much smaller than something like the sun. Uh, so they're kind of this intermediary stage where if you go a little bit less, you can't sustain hydrogen fusion in your core and you become a brown dwarf. Um, but these do sustain uh, fusion. So that's why, that's why they're still stars. Um, so they're, they're very dim, which makes them hard to find because uh, you know, they don't produce a lot of light. Uh, but they're also very small, and that's actually really good for a lot of the ways that we find planets. So some, some other uh, reasons you might want to care. Here I'm showing you the census of all objects within 10 parsecs. It's, it's a little bit outdated um, since we have a new space telescope called Gaia up there, but this is, this is fairly complete. So you can see that it's color-coded by the size or spectral type of the object. Um, specifically, so within 10 parsecs, you can see that these M dwarfs plus K dwarfs, there's certainly a lot more M dwarfs than K dwarfs. They make up about 86% of all the stars. So if you extrapolate that, you can actually say that M dwarfs make up about 70 to 75% of all the stars in the galaxy. So the vast majority of stars are these small little stars. They're very ubiquitous. And we know that uh, they host a lot of terrestrial planets from all of the, um, the work that was done by the Kepler Space Telescope. So here is a plot from a collaborator, Kevin Hardigree Ullman. And I'm showing you the temperature, which is binned by spectral type. So, um, so you're going to decreasing stellar mass as you move to the left. And you're also getting colder, as you can see. Um, so uh, the the M dwarfs that I'm talking about are these objects all the way on the left. And you can see that there is this increase in the number of uh, terrestrial sized short period planets that these stars host. Um, so if you consider all planets with longer orbital periods, up to 50 days, uh, studies have shown that on average, 2.5 um, planets per star orbit these small stars. So they host a lot of these terrestrial sized planets. And that means things that are Earth or Mars sized. So another important aspect of these planetary systems is that they're all orbiting close to their host star. So here I'm showing you probably the most famous system around a low mass star. This is TRAPPIST-1. And you can see all seven of the known planets orbit their host star closer than Mercury orbits the sun. And in general, all terrestrial planets around low mass stars orbit closer than 1 AU. And that's, the, that's just the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So these are very compact, tightly packed systems. <clears throat> so the final fact I'll give you about low mass stars is that they have these extremely long and stable lifetimes when they're on the main sequence, when they're, they're doing their hydrogen fusion. Uh, so this means that their, their luminosity or brightness doesn't vary much over that very long time span. So you can see here that their main sequence lifetime can go up to trillions of years, so much longer than the current age of the universe. Um, and the fact that they're very stable is important uh, because it, you don't run into issues. For instance, the sun is uh, approximately 30% brighter today than when it formed. And that, um, that poses some issues when we, uh, when we talk about water on the surface of Earth um, and, and how things evolved. But these stars remain very stable over these long periods of time. <clears throat> uh, so another thing to say is that any star that was born of this mass at the beginning of the universe, I mean, not necessarily at the very beginning, but even the oldest M dwarf is still stable on the main sequence. It hasn't evolved um, to uh, a giant or a white dwarf the way that our sun will, will evolve eventually. So in aggregate, 
all of these characteristics are what make these low mass stars extremely valuable for studying habitability within our galaxy. <clears throat> So uh, my research is focused on understanding the evolution of planetary systems around low mass stars using statistical tools and these big data surveys. And in particular, I focus mainly on two questions. How do planet-planet interactions influence planetary system evolution and habitability? Uh, and how do star-planet interactions influence planetary system evolution and habitability? So the first part of my talk is gonna focus on understanding these planet-planet interactions and their consequences. And I'll get into that right now. So here I'm showing a visualization of the giant impact that was this uh, moon forming event in our own solar system. And this event happened fairly early on in our solar system's life at about a hundred million years after it formed. And we believe the impactor was a Mars-sized body, and it's been called the, the fifth terrestrial planet. Um, and the collision created this large amount of dust which orbited the Earth uh, until it finally coalesced into the moon as it's doing right here. So some important questions that are related to this event in particular is, was this giant impact important or even necessary for life on Earth. Um, so the impact created the moon and the moon is important for lunar tides, which help transport heat from the equator to the poles. How important um, are these aspects for the way that life evolved on our own planet? Uh, another thing that this impact did was it caused the rotation rate of the Earth to increase. And you know what effect would a slower rotation rate have had on life? Um, and a question that I'm particularly interested in is, what if this impact happened later in the solar system's life? Uh, you know, how would that have affected how life evolved or, or when the genesis of life uh, began to happen on Earth? <clears throat> And the reason that this last question is particularly interesting is because simulations of the solar system have shown that when you suppress giant planet formation, then giant impacts like this can occur much later in the lifetime of the system, as late as a billion years after the solar system formed. Uh, so, so this is an example of um, an impact in our own solar system, but what does this look like around another star. So <clears throat> to help orient you here, this is called a spectral energy distribution. It's the energy output of a star or, or a star system because it's all unresolved uh, as a function of wavelength. So I, these kind of plots will show up a few times in the talk, um, but the X axis is just wavelength. So as you move from the left to the right, you're going to redder and longer wavelengths. And then um, as you're going up, you're just, the energy output is going higher here, basically. So a couple of features to point out. The black curve, this is the expected energy output from the host star, from the, the actual star. Um, but you see that up in the top right, there's this large deviation from the black line. And this is the excess mid-infrared flux. Uh, and we believe that this is created by orbiting dust, which reprocesses the starlight and then re-emits it at longer wavelengths. Um, so these types of spectral energy distributions, we believe to originate from giant impacts or these planet-planet collisions. And they're notable for having these large amounts of excess mid-infrared flux. And we, we call these things um, uh, extreme mid-infrared excesses. And they're roughly defined as having a fractional luminosity in the mid-infrared that's about 1% of the total stellar luminosity. <clears throat> so one other thing I should mention about these types of systems is that they're very rare. They are ex the uh, estimated rate of finding these types of systems just from a random um, assortment of stars is about 0.0004% of solar type stars exhibit these types of excesses. 
Uh, and up until um, I started my graduate work, there was no low mass star that was known to host one of these mid infrared excesses, these extreme mid infrared excesses. And, and I'll show you what my work did in a minute. Um, but I found this surprising when I was a graduate student, uh, mostly because of all the things that I mentioned before, how ubiquitous these um, stars are and how they tend to host so many terrestrial planets. Um, and they also have these extremely long lifetimes. So a long time for planetary systems to, you know, possibly become dynamically unstable. Um, so, so going into my graduate work, the question was, do these systems exist around low mass stars or, or do they not exist? Were they, or were they limited by um, current, uh, current facilities up to that point? So my graduate work utilized these uh, two big data surveys, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and data from the Wild, Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer um, to investigate this question. So the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, also known as SDSS, is an optical survey, uh, primarily in the Northern Hemisphere, although they've now moved to the Southern Hemisphere. Um, but at the time that I did this, they had observed roughly one third of the entire sky. And they imaged it in five optical bands between um, 3,500 and 9,000 angstroms, so right in the optical wavelength. Whereas the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, also known as WISE, uh, was a space of space-based observatory that performed an all-sky survey in three, uh, technically four mid-infrared bands, um, three microns to 22 microns. So in combination, these surveys are ideal for identifying these extreme mid-infrared excesses. Um, so here I'm showing you another spectral energy distribution of ID8. This is a sun-like star that has one of these extreme mid-infrared excesses. So Sloan, is useful for probing the stellar portion of the spectral energy distribution. This is just where the, the, the main energy output is from the star. And WISE is able to detect these extremely large mid-infrared excesses. Um, there's also this little portion in between the two. We call that the near-infrared. And to probe this, we have another survey called two mass. And this is useful just in a, just in calibrating what type of star you're looking at between the optical and the near infrared. Um, <clears throat> so part of what my work did is try to find enough low mass stars that we could statistically hope to see one of these extreme mid infrared excesses. So the classical methods of selecting stars involve um, plotting up their colors in these either optical or near infrared or mid infrared bands and looking for objects that have the expected colors of low mass stars or whatever object you're looking for. So here on the top I'm showing you is called a color color plot and it's uh, from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey using the three redis filters, the R and the I and the Z. And um, this is basically just a flux ratio, even though it says I minus C and R minus I. Uh, th those are magnitudes, which is something from astronomy that I won't I won't subject you to, but it's basically just a flux ratio of how how much flux is um, in one band versus the other band. What's the ratio of that? So on the X axis is showing you redder objects as you move to the right, and the Y axis is showing you redder objects as you move up. <clears throat> so redder objects and fader objects are found at the top right of this plot. And the problem with using this approach is that many different sources tend to have uh, similar colors. So <clears throat> the example I'm showing you here is these three objects on the bottom. Um, they're, they're all classified as point sources from Sloan, uh, but you can see that they have, you know, some similar-ish colors. So you could ask yourself, you know, which one of these do you think is the dwarf, uh, dwarf star, which one is the giant star, and which one is the distant galaxy? Um, and we can get back to that in a little bit. Um, but the, all hope is not lost because there's a way to break this degeneracy. So we can actually see and measure the tangential motion of objects on the sky to figure out which one is a star 
versus these more distant objects. So in this illustration, I'm showing you that this low mass star, which tends to be nearer because it's, uh, it's fainter. So in order for it to be as bright as something like a giant star, it must be much closer to us than the giant star. It will have uh, a motion on the sky over time. So we can observe this object, you know, over years or decades, and we'll actually see it move on the sky. Um, whereas giant stars uh, will have very little motion, and galaxies should have, you know, approximately zero motion over these types of baselines, these time baselines. So just by measuring the motions of the stars, we can discriminate between low mass stars and these other types of objects. So um, <clears throat> now I'll tell you the truth to the images below to see how close you were. Um, it's usually the, the giant that gets everyone, I would say. Most people think that's the galaxy. <clears throat> so as part of my graduate work, I combined all three of these data sets, um, two mass and SDSS and WISE, all, all three of them. And I use the astrometry uh, between these surveys to measure the motions of the objects that uh, have colors that are consistent with low mass stars. So here I'm showing you an image of the motion of one of the objects from my catalog uh, in imaging data. And the baseline is about 10 years. So this is how this object is moving over 10 years. And the size of the image is one arc minute by one arc minute. And just for reference, the moon is about 30 arc minutes large in the sky, which is half a degree. So this is one of the fastest moving stars in my sample, but we were actually able to measure motions down to about seven milli arc seconds, which at the time was decently impressive, but now we live in the era of Gaia and unfortunately Gaia uh, can go down to micro arc seconds. Gaia is extremely precise. So this is a little outdated, um, but it was very, very necessary uh, for the later parts of my dissertation work. So the resulting catalog I built was called the Motion Verified Red Stars or Movers Catalog. And I should mention now that astronomers love their tortured acronyms. So um, you're gonna see a few of them in this talk. The, the plot on the right is showing you the number of stars as a function of color um, or spectral type. Uh, temperature or mass. So uh, those are all going to the right. Mass is decreasing, temperature is decreasing, spectral type is, is you would say it's increasing. Um, and this catalog contained about 9 million stars. And it was built in a, in a very systematic manner, the way that I, I classified things based on color and measured their proper motions. And that's gonna play an important role later on when we talk about completeness. Um, but at the time that it was built, it was also the largest proper motion catalog of low mass stars. Um, and, it, and it still has some utility even in the era of Gaia because Gaia is not able to observe very red, very faint objects, these, these lowest mass stars um, and brown dwarfs, at least not out to very uh, far distances. And I also built this secondary catalog, which was called the late type extension of movers late movers. So these are, are things that are much colder. Um, the, uh, it's a mixture of stars and brown dwarfs. Um, and in order to, to do that catalog, I actually had to recalibrate all of the Sloan astrometry for these extremely red sources because all of their, um, their measurements of the, the position on the sky is based on bluer band passes, but as I mentioned, these are very red sources. So we had to calibrate them to the red band passes. Uh, and you can see that these, these objects in this late mover, they go down to below 2000 Kelvin. So now we are into the brown dwarf regime. <clears throat> so the next thing we need to consider is what objects can we actually observe a large infrared excess around? So there's a lot going on in this plot and I'll take a little bit of time to explain it. But the axes are um, showing you the colors and brightness of objects similar to how we saw uh, previously. And a question that we wanna know is over what range of brightness and colors are we sensitive to these extreme mid-infrared fluxes from the star? 
uh, or even if it doesn't have an excess, can we just detect the what we would call the photospheric level of mid-infrared flux? Um, and particularly, we're interested in what are the limits for sources that we can only detect if they have this extreme mid-infrared excess. So the colors in this plot correspond to the expected flux at 12 microns um, from only the star. And this red dashed line uh, towards the top right, this demarcates the region where we can make a 12 micron detection, even if the star doesn't have any excess flux. So this is basically our sensitivity limit to just the star. And the red dashed dot line uh, towards the middle, this is the region where we uh, will only get a detection if the star shows a large excess of flux at 12 microns. And we pick 12 microns because that's kind of the, the peak value where you expect the temperature of orbiting dust to be um, at, at a similar Earth-like uh, temperature. So basically, this is kind of a region where you would expect terrestrial planets to orbit around these types of stars is if they're emitting thermal uh, radiation at 12 microns. So this line, uh, the dash dot line shows uh, that we can detect it if the excess is 10 times larger than just the stellar flux at that level. And that's actually pretty typical for these um, extreme and infrared excesses. So from this sample, I identified 584 low mass stars for these extreme mid infrared excesses. So here I'm showing you another spectral energy distribution, but this is for one of the objects that I found. Um, all of these, these points uh, are showing photometry from the different surveys, SDSS, 2MESS, and WISE. So you could think of each one of these as a different filter that the object was observed through, and then how many photons um, that object is, is uh, producing at that wavelength range. So I'm showing you the uh, model stellar photosphere, which best fits the data, and that's in gray. Um, actually, that's, that's in blue. The gray is the, uh, is the combination of the best model for the stellar photosphere and for this mid-infrared flux, which we fit as just a thermal black body, and that's the red dotted line. So. I found a few of these, but the real question we would like to answer is, are these giant impacts more common around low mass stars than sun-like stars? And while these large samples are useful for finding uh, rare phenomena like this, um, in order to answer the question I just posed, we actually need tools to estimate the completeness of the sample um, and account for any objects that are potentially missing from our, uh, from our sample. So to do that, we can use a model. We can build a model, um, a model for the structure and the kinematics of the galaxy. And this is to account for how the sample was created. So for the structure, I use this canonical model of the galaxy on the left. It's made up of a bulge in the middle and then this thin and thick disk portion and halo components. And, and that's basically um, different ages of stars are found within each one of those components. So <clears throat> for the solar neighborhood, um, we don't need to worry about the bulge component because we're far enough away from the center of the galaxy uh, that you know the number of stars we see is very, very small. It's, it's basically zero. Um, but this, these equations show how the density, the stellar density of each one of these components kind of fall off as you move either through the disk or up and down uh, from the disk. That's Z is, is in the direction up and down from the disk and R is the radial uh, direction away from the disk. So these are the equations that make up the, the structure portion of this. Um, each of these populations basically just depends on the local density and then these coefficients for the scale length and scale height uh, and the, these flattening and gradient parameters. So these are things that we have calibrated empirically um, just using large samples of stars in the local neighborhood. And on the right, I'm showing you the reference system for the kinematics of the galaxy. 
The U component points uh, radially towards or away from the center of the galaxy. And the V component is in the direction of galactic rotation. And then this W component um, points either up, uh, up or down in the plane of the galaxy. So <clears throat> we have equations that govern the uh, bulk motion of stars in this coordinate system, the, the average. And the average radial velocity of stars in the solar neighborhood is essentially zero, uh, as is the um, average tangential or perpendicular motion. But the circular velocities are dependent on the average circular velocity of stars in the plane. And this, this you can see that there are uh, some factors here. These extra factors have to account for stars being dynamically heated as they age. So you can think of a star um, being born in the, in the thin disk, in the plane of the galaxy. And it's basically, all its motion is kind of circular around the galaxy. But over time, it interacts with other stars and gas as it spins around. And then that gives it little kicks that move it up and down, up or down, and then radially inward, radially outward. So um, you can actually measure the ages of, of uh, populations of stars just based on their bulk kinematics. Um, so we can, we can put all of these things, we can calibrate them with empirical measurements, um, and then we put them all into a little toolbox, we connect them all, we create this toy model, and mine was called the low mass kinematics model, or LOKI. Um, so now that we have a model to estimate the completeness of the sample, we can try to account for all of the stars that were missing from our sample and compute this global fraction of stars exhibiting these, uh, these extreme infrared excesses. So I found that um, low mass stars are about 50 times more likely to exhibit these signatures of a giant impact than our sun-like stars. And while Early collisions could be beneficial to life as they, you know, the moon forming event is in our own solar system. Later type collisions could potentially be catastrophic. Uh, so it's, it's important to see if these giant impacts have a, an age dependence um, or if they're, we're seeing these types of impacts just around young stars. So, <clears throat> Aging stars is extremely difficult, especially for low mass stars where uh, standard methods are not well calibrated, but we can look at age dependent properties for populations of stars. So one useful age tracer is placement in the galaxy. So this plot uses astroseismic ages of red giant stars from the, the Sloan Apogee survey. Um, and it shows the average age of the stars as a function of its distance from the galactic center uh, on the x-axis and its distance from the plane of the galaxy on the y-axis. So if we just consider the solar neighborhood or a sphere of about one kiloparsec around the sun, uh, then galactic height is a useful proxy for age. Um, the average age of stars is increasing as we're moving away from the galactic plane. So this method of aging stars is called galactic stratigraphy. And it's been used uh, in many different studies to map age dependent properties of, of stars. So here on the right, I'm showing the fraction of stars that exhibit hydrogen emission as a function of distance from the galactic plane. So hydrogen emission uh, has a very well studied age dependency in low mass stars where younger stars exhibit uh, more hydrogen emission than older stars. And you can see that towards uh, the plane, near the plane of the galaxy at zero, um, there is a large fraction of stars which are exhibiting hydrogen emission. Uh, but the number of stars that, that exhibit hydrogen emission is decreasing as you move away from the galactic plane. So, if this was a flat trend, that would indicate no age dependency. Um, basically, any star at any age would exhibit H alpha, this hydrogen emission. Um, so I can apply this same idea to my own sample, galactic stratigraphy. 
<clears throat> and we do see a similar trend with galactic height. So here I'm showing you the fraction of stars that show an extreme mid-infrared excess uh, as a function of distance from the galactic plane. So all of these numbers now have been completeness corrected using the model that I mentioned earlier. Um, and although the limits on the y-axis of these two plots are vastly different, there is a similar, very statistically robust trend here. And this trend actually implies two things. First, that there is an age dependency for these observed giant impacts, uh, meaning that they're more likely to happen in relatively younger stellar populations than older populations. Uh, but second, that this trend has a preferential time scale over which it happens, over which these giant impacts happen. Um, and this is actually something that we can investigate using, using evolutionary models uh, of, of the galaxy and then injecting a time scale for these collisions and comparing the outputs of that simulation to observational data. Um, and and this, this type of thing has been done for other types of stars. And th this is kind of one of my ongoing projects right now is to try and tease out a time scale for these collisions, uh, whether they happen in the first, you know, 100 million years or first giga year or within the first 5 billion years. Um, so that, that has some important uh, implications for habitability. <clears throat> Uh, but next, I want to talk about a potential observational consequence of these giant impacts that we might be seeing in the data from transiting planet surveys. So here I'm going to be talking about data from the Kepler Space Telescope um, and its difficulty in using a single model for planetary systems to reproduce the observed planet yield that we get from this transiting planet survey. Uh, so in this figure, I'm showing the uh, Kepler planet yield as blue diamonds. And this is uh, uh, as a function of the planets observed in the system around the number of stars that they were observed around. So the figure shows the best fit model to all the data, assuming some underlying multi-planet distribution that has a, you know, a range of in the number of planets and inclination angles, obliquities and eccentricities. And eccentricities. And you can see here that the model underestimates the number of single planet systems, but it also overestimates the number of systems with two planets. So <clears throat> if the model is fit to only the multi-planet system, so two or more planets, there's good agreement to everything with two or more planets. Um, but you know, not surprisingly, the number of single planet systems is still severely underestimated. Uh, but if we can use two separate models, one for the multi-planet systems, and then one for these single planet systems. And then we ask, what is the ratio of these two models that we need to obtain the observed planet yield? Here, uh, is this two component fit? And they actually found that a 50% model mixture is required to fully reproduce observation. So that means 50% of the systems are multi-planet systems and 50% of the systems are just have a, a single transiting planet. So one of the theories behind what is causing these two planet populations is that um, planets were either scattered or ejected or collided, which evolved these multi-planet systems into these single transiting planet systems. And giant impacts are actually a, a pathway to this sort of system evolution. Now, this study went one step further to look at stars in the single planet systems and multi planet systems that were observed. And they found that on average, the stars hosting the single planet systems had uh, slower rotation rates and, and were found farther away from the galactic plane than the stars which were hosting multi planet systems. And this implies that the single planet systems appear older than the multi-planet systems. Um, however, there is a caveat in this result because the differences between these two populations were only about 1.5 sigma. Uh, and herein lies the limitation of Kepler. So Kepler uh, was incredible to exoplanet research. It, it found uh, thousands of planets. I think, you know, even to this day, we're still finding things in the Kepler data. 
But Kepler only looked at this small patch of sky during its initial mission. Um, so it didn't observe a large range of galactic heights that distance from the, the plane of the galaxy. And you can see the plane of the galaxy clearly here, that dark band running uh, right um, diagonally through it. So applying methods like galactic stratigraphy are limited without a larger sample. Um, <clears throat> and Kepler didn't observe that many low mass stars, unfortunately. So the statistics are a bit limited. Uh, this this is a pro, uh, yeah the range of the galactic heights. So <clears throat> the answer to Kepler's limitations is currently in space taking data right now, and it's the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, and it's conducting an all sky transit survey for planets around the brightest stars. And this on, animation is basically showing you the observing strategy for tests. Uh, it observes in the south for one year, and then it flips over and to do the north. But a consequence of this observing method is that it has variable coverage where the poles are gonna have continuous data for that one year that it's um, observing in that hemisphere. But the other portions of the sky are limited um, to about 27 days worth of continuous data for the, for the shortest cadences. Um, but then we can do repeat observations. So you can, you can extend those, but it won't be continuous. You'll, you'll be waiting another year for some of that. It's less of a problem for low mass stars because their planets typically have a uh, short orbital period. So this is, is well suited to find planets around low mass stars. Um, so TESS will find thousands of planets just orbiting low mass stars is the expectation. Uh, and hopefully TESS is gonna be transformative for exoplanets around low mass stars. It's, it's been up there for a few years now, and um, hopefully it'll be up there for a few more years. And uh, we we keep finding better ways to reduce the data, uh, push its um, sensitivity down. So I'm excited to see how many planets this finds around low mass stars um, in the next couple of years. <clears throat> and that that will uh, help us answer these planet planet interactions by finding planets hopefully within these systems that have these extreme mid-infrared excesses. So we'll have to stay tuned for some of those results. But next I wanna talk about these star-planet interactions and how they could influence habitability. Um, so we're gonna go back to this plot with the habitable planets. And I want you to look at the planets around the low mass stars. So there, there is this gap, which maybe you notice, between the lowest mass systems that we found and the rest of the population. I'll, I'll draw this line for it. Now this could simply be an observational bias because these systems are very red and very faint. Uh, and additional surveys that target this population may help um, elucidate this in coming years. But for now, we're gonna focus on these two lowest mass systems. This is uh, TRAPPIST-1 and Tea Garden Star. And there is something that's very interesting and peculiar about these two lowest mass planet hosts. <clears throat> so here I'm showing you low resolution near infrared spectra for TRAPPIST-1 and Tea Garden Star. And these spectra were taken using the SPECS instrument on the NASA Infrared Telescope Facility, which we also call the IRTF. So I'm showing you here some various atomic and molecular features that are common in the spectra of low mass stars. So if we compare what these stars look like to their um, best matching, uh, you could say like counterparts, uh, assuming that these are, are old stars, we get these matches. And qualitatively, these comparisons you know, look fairly decent, but there's a number of places that they deviate from one another. Uh, but if I show you the best match to any type of star, including young and old stars, this is what you get. And you can see that uh, th these are much better matches overall. And these are actually both young stars that these are fit to. Um, <clears throat> so uh, a question you might ask is, are these planetary systems very young? Or these, these stars, are they very young? So we can look uh, a little more closely at T Garden Star. So here, um, the number of deviations 
between this old star and T garden stars, I think the most prominent deviation is this H band here. Um, and this is, this is typical from um, collision induced H2. And this is a feature that's common in young stars to have this triangular H band uh, because they have less dense atmospheres. They're still contracting onto the main sequence. So you can think of them as being a little, a little puffy as gravity kind of like pulls them in and shrinks their radius. <clears throat> so, uh, so again, this might ask, you know, are these younger stars? And we can look at higher resolution spectra of young and old objects to see how deep these similarities go. So here, um, here is some high resolution spectra. And if we do kind of a deeper dive here, now we're looking closer at the atomic and molecular features between these stars. And you can see uh, on the right that the planet host deviates greatly from the younger star. It doesn't have as deep of VO absorption and it's, it's completely missing the hydrogen emission. Um, also the line depths are, are quite different in a lot of the, um, the atoms, the potassium for instance. <clears throat> um, and then uh, the atomic and molecular features appear more similar when you look at the comparison to the older star, but the lines tend to not be as deep uh, and the iron hydride doesn't really match up well. Um, so what, what else could we potentially look at to distinguish if these planet hosts are young or old? <clears throat> so now in this plot, I'm showing you velocity components that I mentioned before. The, U component is the radial component and the W component is this um, up and down tangent to the plane. And then the V component is a circular velocity. So I've, I've plotted up a bunch of different things here, including the two lowest mass planet hosts. And the, um, <clears throat> the younger sources are these thin disk sources and they're kind of in this middle bottom portion where, you know, they're, uh, distribution in this in this velocity space is not very extended. They're all kind of just moving circularly with very little radial or tangential velocity. And then as you move out in the radial and tangential way, you get into these thick disk stars, which are older and dynamically heated. Um, so <clears throat> these uh, sources are all very young and they all have these signatures of very low gravity. Um, but you can see that T garden star here and Trappist one, their kinematics make them look not young at all. They look very old. Um, and no young star is typically found with kinematics like this. And in addition, there's, um, other age tracers, which actually make these two stars look very old. So it does seem that these stars are old, but then the question uh, remains, why are they showing signs of inflated radii? So <clears throat> there's a couple of uh, possibilities just from, from studies of how stars evolve. There's uh, low metallicity, which could make these stars masquerade, it's low gravity sources, uh, uh, except that the comparisons to known low metallicity stars show that their features are actually inconsistent so they don't look like low metallicity stars. Also increased magnetic activity can also modulate the radii of these low mass stars. Um, <clears throat> but these stars don't appear to be relatively magnetically active. So uh, that's basically traced through this hydrogen emission that I talked about. And these stars are relatively magnetically inactive or quiet. So one last uh, thing that has been brought up is tidal effects between the star and the planet, which could potentially model, modulate radii. It's, it's actually a very young theory, and there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on this, um, both theoretically and observationally. Uh, but this is one of the things that I'm currently doing. So I have a program uh, using the IRTF to obtain near-infrared spectra for all of the lowest mass stars that are being targeted by or have been targeted by Kepler and TESS to study statistically if radius inflation occurs more often around planet hosts than stars that aren't planet hosts. 
So uh, in addition to this, I'm looking into uh, theoretical work to investigate what the tidal effects would be from uh, one of these low mass stars that evolves with a close in planet system. So <clears throat> part of this is a uh, recharacterization of all the stars by aggregating all those surveys, as I mentioned before. Um, so using, using methods, like I mentioned before, um, there's actually a, a source that we have recalibrated. So it was originally an M4 planet host. Uh, this is where it lied on this color or this temperature diagram. Um, and as I mentioned before, the planetary parameters are tied to the stellar parameters. So if you look at the star, this star actually looks more like an M6 than an M4. Um, and it's also magnetically uh, quiet. So here the black line is this star and I'm comparing it to different, like just typical, typical stars that you would see from these different uh, temperatures or spectral types. And you can see that the black line doesn't have a, a lot of this H alpha emission, which means that it's probably an older source. Uh, but it also looks like it's lower temperature and mass than it was initially estimated to be. This is that that weak um, weak emission here. <clears throat> so that indicates that it's probably an older star as well. So um, we can move it to where it belongs now, and now it it falls right below that that line, where uh, we're starting to build up more systems um, in this region, this ultra cool dwarf region. So I think this means that we need to go back and, and recharacterize a lot of the stars from these catalogs uh, to determine how many things are missing from this gap. So <laughs> this star also uh, shows signatures of radius inflation, like I mentioned before, where here I'm showing you just the potassium line of the star in red and comparing that to a young star and an old star. And you can see that um, it's, it's a much shallower line. So uh, the deeper the line, the more surface gravity is increasing. So this is, this is uh, one of the projects that I'm currently working on is understanding this. <clears throat> I also have a program to directly measure the size of the second smallest planet host, which is Tea Garden Star. And that's using the Chara interferometer. So it's composed of six uh, one meter telescopes that can be used in different configurations to provide a variety of baselines the longest of which is 330 meters, and that gives a resolution of about 50 milli arc seconds in the near infrared. And this star currently has about a 30% scatter uh, in its radius estimate from the literature. So we're hoping to reduce that down to a 5% measurement, um, which will actually be the first time that we can actually directly determine uh, if these planet hosts have radius inflation or not. So I actually just got the first data for this last week. So hopefully in the next couple of weeks, I'll have it all reduced and I'll have some, some data points for that. So, um, so just as planet-planet interactions have implications on habitability, star-planet interactions also can have a, an important part of the bigger picture of habitability in our galaxy. And specifically, if these interactions modulate the stellar radii and that changes their luminosity, which changes their position, uh, the position of their habitable zones and does this uh, evolution of the habitable zone around these low mass stars, does that have a, an effect on their overall habitability? So one of the things I am looking to do uh, with collaborators is search for signs of these magnetic interactions through radio data. So for these very close orbiting planets, um, we might expect that the magnetic fields are actually uh, are actually tied to the planets. And we might be able to see things like Aurora originating from this. And, and there have been some claims, but I don't think anything very conclusive has shown up just yet. So hopefully um, in the next couple of years, we'll have some answers there. So for, for the future, um, we have a few things on the horizon. This one is called the Rubin Observatory, and it's gonna take 30 terabytes of data each night. Uh, it, it's like Sloan, but kind of um, on steroids. So it's going to look at 40% of the sky in the south. It's going to repeat fields twice a week for 10 years. 
And it's gonna look um, in five optical and near infrared bands from this, this wavelength range, which is a little redder than optical. Um, <clears throat> and this, this image here on the right is from Sloan. And you can see that uh, there's, there's this stellar sequence, but then there's also these galaxies. Uh, and being able to differentiate these two populations is gonna be extremely important for Rubin because Rubin is gonna be operating way down here at this faint limit where galaxies are gonna start overtaking stars in terms of uh, things that kind of look the same. So we're gonna have to find new statistical tools to differentiate these stars from galaxies, um, aside from just proper motion because Gaia is only gonna get us so far. And then I mentioned that the James Webb Space Telescope is up in space now. It was it launched on Christmas day. It was absolutely amazing. And um, it's finally made it to L2. And we're all very excited about this, uh, but this is gonna allow us to constrain the mineralogy of disks that we find in these extreme mid-infrared excess systems. And that gives us an idea into the, the origins of these types of systems, because there's an expected crystallinity from uh, these dust heated grains within these giant impacts. And then <clears throat> the last thing in, in the next you know 20 years, maybe the successor to even James Webb Space Telescope and Hubble is things like Louvoir. Uh, this is a 10 meter class telescope in space, which is absolutely amazing. Um, but this will drive our sensitivity limit down way, way farther so that uh, we're gonna be able to see these giant impacts out to much greater distances and around uh, even fainter systems than we're able to right now. Um, so for reference, here is the telescope that I use for my study in comparison to things like James Webb and this other origin space telescope. And it's, it's just tiny. Uh, so I, I just wanna thank all of my collaborators um, from all over the place that have, have made all of this, uh, you know, have enabled the science and that I'm still continuing projects with. So uh, I'll leave this up and thank you all for listening to me. Thanks, Chris. That was amazing. Um, unfortunately, we don't have much time for quite many, much time for many questions. But if there are a few people who would like maybe to ask one or two quick questions, um, I think we have time for that. If people want to stick around just a little bit longer. Uh, Madeline. Hi, thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. I have one quick clarifying question. It was, I think, back on your slides where you were talking about um, the difference between like multi-planet and single planet systems and like which had something was older and I was wondering I think I missed whether or not it was like an older star that you were associating um, the single planet with or like older planet um, sure um, back. so I think I think this maybe is the slide that you were talking about um yeah, it was like a you had like put Sorry. older like on like a oh yeah yeah okay yeah. um yeah let me let me get through the animation a bit. uh okay so I I think this is what you were referring to where there was singles and multis so um the idea here is that if you if you look at all of the systems that only have one transiting planet. Um, in comparison to all of the systems that have more than one transiting planet. And you look at these two age tracers, the rate of um, stellar rotation and their distance from the galactic plane, then what we find is that these single systems, these stars that host just one planet tend to have slower rotation rates and are farther away from the galactic plane. So rotation rates are also a, a tracer of age because um, as stars, age, they do something called magnetic breaking. So they'll actually slow down over time as these magnetic fields like pull, uh, pull material away from them, basically. Yeah. Cool, thank you. That clarified, sorry. Okay. All right. Well, if there aren't any further questions, thanks, Chris, again, for an amazing talk. Good luck on your future, future research, and um, we'll see you next week, everybody. Thanks. Oh, and don't forget to um, end the recording there. End the recording, right. Here, I can also...
well, I'll I'll end the recording and then I'll make you.